Hey everyone, Chris here. Thanks for checking out the podcast. If you're enjoying it and learning something along with us, please consider becoming a supporting patron at patreon.com slash a teacher of history. Or you could leave a rating and review on iTunes. It would be a huge help. If you'd like to raise your hand and participate along with us, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, at a teacher fifth, or shoot me an email, chris at a teacher history.com. All right, let's get on to the next episode. Hello. Welcome into A Teacher's History of the United States. Thanks so much for joining me again today. Did you know that when war broke out between Britain and France, President Washington made the surprisingly controversial decision to issue a proclamation of neutrality, adding fuel to his political opponent's fiery rhetoric? That the minister of France, Edmond Genet, traveled to America and attempted to openly and publicly sabotage Washington's foreign policy. And that beginning in 1791 and culminating in 1794, Western Pennsylvania farmers presented the first true constitutional crisis to Washington, forcing him to remind them that Washington doesn't play games. Did you know all of this? Maybe, maybe not. Get your notebooks out because we will cover that and more in episode 83, Washington Gets Angry, The Genet Affair and the Whiskey Rebellion. All right, everyone. Welcome in to episode 83, no book recommendation for you this week. So let's just dive right into it. Last week, we covered the first term of President Washington. And we discussed Hamilton's financial plan in great detail, touched briefly on Washington's foreign policy, and dove deeper into the broken relationship between Jefferson and Hamilton. And just as a reminder to everyone, up on the Patreon page at patreon.com slash teacher of history, there's a bonus episode detailing the devolution of the relationship between Hamilton, Jefferson, and Madison and the birth of the Republican Party. If you check it out, let me know what you think. When we left off last week, Washington was sick and tired of being president and just wanted to retire, but his cabinet would not allow that to happen. They knew they needed the great George Washington and the stability that he represented, so they sort of demanded he serve one more term, you know, for the betterment of the country. And we know that his first term was both, at times, exhausting and annoying, and if that's the case, his second term just made him even more miserable. The tenuous peace he had with the natives was dissolving. The French Revolution was, well, chopping people's heads off. Western farmers staged an actual rebellion against the government, and the bickering of Jefferson and Hamilton only increased in tone and occurrence. Adding family health issues and his own health issues just made things even worse. With all those things happening around him, the force field that had previously made him impervious to the most public criticism was starting to wear off, and people slowly began to take shots at him more and more, both personally and professionally. And by shots, I mean like verbal criticisms, not actual shots. (laughs) In April 1793, at the beginning of his second term, things became pretty complicated. France had declared war with Britain, actually, They declared war with all the monarchies of Europe, which doesn't seem like a particularly pragmatic strategy, but their conflict with Britain is what was particularly concerning to the United States. Hearing about the war while he was attending the funeral of a family member at Mount Vernon, Washington rushed back to Philadelphia, because remember, Philadelphia is the temporary capital of the U.S. while D.C. was being built. Washington summoned a cabinet meeting on April 19th to determine what stance to take in this conflict. So, April 19, 1793, Washington convenes with his cabinet, and after meeting with them and considering all of their options, Washington decided to issue a statement of neutrality, declaring that the United States of America would not be getting involved in this conflict, which, 
on its face seemed like a pretty wise decision. The proclamation said that his administration was, quote, forbidding citizens to take part in any hostilities in the seas on behalf of or against any belligerent powers. While the entire cabinet was in favor of technically being neutral in this conflict, including Thomas Jefferson, what Jefferson did not agree with was the aforementioned proclamation of neutrality. Jefferson felt like neutrality made sense, like remaining neutral. Yeah, that's a great idea, but there's no need to permanently declare it and close the door for future considerations. Jefferson, in fact, favored operating with neutrality but not making definitive decisions. He figured it would be wise to leverage America's power and presence, although at this time we know it left a lot to be desired, against France and Britain to see who the most interested country would be in American support. Not wanting to open the door to any possibility of some type of French alliance, Alexander Hamilton boldly stated that an official proclamation of neutrality was clearly the best course of action. Jefferson and Hamilton, surprise, surprise, went back and forth on this issue of the proclamation, with Hamilton once again arguing that it was a non-negotiable action. And once again, Hamilton was bending Washington's ear. And he was the one that got his way. And once again, Jefferson was left frustrated. Following the declaration, Hamilton and Madison, with considerable influence from Mr. Jefferson, went tit for tat in an essay battle to convince the American public of whose decision was more correct. Hamilton, writing under the pseudonym Pacifist, argued that it was within executive power to declare peace. Since France declared war on Britain, it did not violate the defensive alliance the U.S. had with France. And if the U.S. were to side with France, it would make them vulnerable to attacks in North America from Britain and Spanish influence over the Native American peoples. Jefferson read some of these essays that Hamilton wrote. It's like for the first time, Hamilton got out in front of Madison and Jefferson's criticisms that he knew were coming his way. And Jefferson read them, and he got himself all worked up and then directed Madison to respond. Madison, who was uncomfortable with the request, explained to Jefferson that foreign affairs was not really in his wheelhouse. And since he was at home at his plantation for the time, he did not have all of his books, papers, etc. to draw from. Oh, and he had company that was overstaying their welcome and just wouldn't leave. Gosh, how annoying. But like he had in each instance prior, Madison relented to the pressure from Jefferson and sat down to the grueling task of trying to refute Alexander Hamilton from his distracting plantation without notes. Ah, the agony. Madison wrote that the five essays he penned under the name Helviticus was... Quote, the most grating task I have ever experienced. In sum, Madison countered that Hamilton and his allies, those Federalists, were actually closet monarchists, haters of the American Republic, and men who favored too much executive authority. Madison, and many of his fellow Democratic Republicans, believed that all foreign affairs that were not explicitly stated in the Constitution— such as declaring neutrality, were to be included, were, were to fall under the full authority of Congress. The debate over neutrality was another seminal debate between the emerging Federalist and the Democratic Republican Party, who at times in this podcast I just refer to as the Republicans, just to avoid any confusion. And this debate will eventually drive Jefferson to officially resign from Washington's cabinet eight months later in December of 1793. But it wasn't just the essay writings of Hamilton and Madison that raised the blood pressure in the United States in general, and Washington in particular, but a gentleman named Edmund Genet, the minister of France who had recently arrived in the United States. Now, Genet was a young, excitable, and intelligent diplomat who had grown up loathing all things monarchy and a devout supporter of the French Revolution. He arrived in Charleston, South Carolina, on April 8, 1793, and those in the South had anticipated his arrival. Since many of the South Carolinians at the time had Republican leanings and were partial to the French, they greeted Genet like a celebrity. Genet's first mistake, and something he would continue to repeat, 
was that he basked too much in the excitement of the American fittivive instead of making his way to Philadelphia to receive his accreditation from Washington like he should have done. In order to continue to endear himself to the American people and emphasize his pro-revolutionary beliefs, he told them to refer to him as Citizen Genet. For timeline purposes, Genet landed in South Carolina right as Washington was heading back to Philadelphia to meet with his cabinet to determine next steps. But he wasn't just there for fun, he had business to take care of. Genet had been sent to negotiate with the American government to gain protection for French lands in the Caribbean, to inquire if the U.S. would be able to increase their debt payments, and to ensure that necessary goods would continue to flow freely to France during this trying time. But while he was in South Carolina, he figured he wouldn't waste any time in making stuff happen. See, the original treaty with France, the American-French alliance of 1778, allowed for American privateer ships to attack British ships. After getting permission from the South Carolina governor, William Moultrie, to raise a privateer fleet, it's exactly what Genet intended on taking advantage of. And in case you didn't know, privateers were private citizens who own boats and engage in official maritime right, naval warfare. They would be able to keep the possessions they capture, and the French government, based on the treaty, would protect and support them. And that's what's so important about Genet being there to officially commission these privateers. Basically, they would take their private ships and, you know, be fighting for the French, technically. Genet and the South Carolinians ended up commissioning four privateering ships. Genet wanted these ships to get involved with Britain's Spanish allies in Florida. Now, as you can imagine, Washington, the man who is declaring neutrality, when hearing word of Genet's arrival and his early actions was none too pleased. As we have mentioned in this podcast, Washington viewed the treaty with the French as null and void since King Louis is now dead. Genet continued to stir the pot, though. As he made his way north ever so casually, he, was continued, he, he continued to be welcome, like a revolutionary celebrity in all these different places that he stopped. He helped to organize small militias. He encouraged the formation of Democratic-Republican social clubs and kept stopping on his way to Philadelphia to continue to drum up support for the war, undermining Washington's proclamation of neutrality the whole time. After taking his sweet old time heading up to Philadelphia, he arrived May 16, 1793, over a month after he landed in South Carolina. As Genet entered Philadelphia and received a hero's welcome there, too, Washington was becoming increasingly frustrated that presenting himself to the American president was apparently pretty far down on the list of Genet's priorities. Genet met with Washington, though, eventually, and demanded that the United States rescind their proclamation of neutrality, which you can probably guess is not going to happen. But in Genet's mind, it was a pretty obvious decision. They were allies with the French based on the treaty signed in 1778, and if you remember, that treaty didn't have an end date, so technically it still applied. But Washington was having none of it. He was absolutely furious with Genet that he had raised militias, commissioned privateers, who, by the way, had captured two British ships and commissioned those ships into the privateer fleet, naming one of them La Petite Democrate. And he was also raising these social clubs, these social gatherings of supporters of the opposition party to Washington. In Genet's mind, though, he felt more and more invincible. Based on his time in America, it seemed like Washington was the one who was out of touch with American sentiment, not, not him. The people had spoken to him, and they loved him. With this, Genet became more reckless with his speech and his plans. Washington's cabinet, Thomas Jefferson, actually, informed Genet that the position of neutrality was their position and the administration had no plans on changing their mind. On top of that, while Jefferson and Genet felt similarly about U.S. involvement, Genet's unilateral actions to raise a militia and privateering fleet were not okay. But Genet did not plan on taking no for an answer, and he did not hold back. 
He wrote a series of essays in the National Gazette attempting to convince Americans that the alliance between France and the United States was still alive and well. He then began to support and even scheme for active support of the French in the war. What probably eventually did him in, though, at least in public opinion, is when he argued that Congress should repudiate Washington's desires to stay neutral and declare an alliance with France anyway. And that, he found out, was taking it a bit too far. See, Genet had this captured British ship in the Delaware River. Remember Le Petit Democrat? Well, he wanted to launch the ship in the French fleet as a captured British ship now commissioned under the French government. But obviously, everyone in Washington's cabinet wanted nothing to do with that plan. It was bad enough to commission these privateers. It is a blatant violation of neutrality, though, to have these American privateers capture a British vessel and recommission it as a French vessel. That doesn't sound very neutral to me. Genet was warned not to do this, but he didn't care. He launched the ship anyway. He figured this would be a perfect opportunity to pit Washington against the people. As his rhetoric and his defiance increased, Hamilton and Jefferson recommended to Washington that, and yes, you heard correctly, Hamilton and Jefferson actually agreed on something. They recommended to Washington that he send Genet a written complaint and demand he cease these actions immediately. And that is exactly what happened. Washington's cabinet issued direct orders explaining how America was going to handle its relationship to foreign nations at war, directly denouncing Genet's words and actions. But Genet just really did not understand that he, in fact, was a lot less invincible than the great George Washington. Genet spoke publicly to the people in Philly and worked them into a tizzy to the point where some of them were directly petitioning Washington himself to enter the war, like standing outside of his house and doing this, and they wanted them to enter the war and ally with the French. Once Genet's correspondence, the correspondence he had back, back and forth to France, well, this was gathered by New York Federalist and printed publicly in a Federalist newspaper. And when this happened, things began to fall apart for Genet. When people saw just how disrespectful he was being towards the United States and Washington in private, his popularity decreased precipitously. Remember, this is George Washington. He chopped down a cherry tree and never told a lie. Well, those two are made up myths about Washington, but you get the idea, right? It, they're not factual, but the truth in them is that is how much people respected him. With Genet exposed, Jefferson actively tried to distance himself from Genet, writing to Madison that, quote, We have decided unanimously in the cabinet to require the recall of Genet. He will sink the Republican interest if they do not abandon him. Jefferson also recognized that it was likely valuable in some ways to have him so brazenly promoting their foreign policy stance publicly without them having to directly get behind it. Eventually, Genet received word that his allies in France were no longer in power, and he was being politely requested to return to France to um, be put on trial, which really means get his head chopped off. Genet being a pretty big fan of his head and wanting it to stay attached to his body, actually went to the uh, uh, weak, out-of-touch George Washington for help. And Washington, being the mature, pragmatic leader that he was, gave asylum to Genet in America, where he continued to live peacefully until the age of 71. While Genet eventually faded away due to his own undisciplined speech, what he did show was the political partisanship and foreign policy went hand in hand. Throughout the face of this political opposition, Washington never wavered. Neutrality was the way to go and the only way to go. On top of this, Washington suspected that a lot of Genet's rhetoric was done for political purposes, at one point complaining that, quote, it is not the cause of France which they regard, for could they involve the country in a war, no matter with whom, and disgrace, 
they would be the first and loudest of the clamors against the expense and impolicy of the measure. But in the end, this political strategy by the Republicans did work. Republicans were able to make Washington the political enemy, standing in the way of supporting the French in their familiar quest for freedom and liberty. On the heels of this drama, Jefferson decided he had had enough of federal politics, resigning from his post as Secretary of State, like I mentioned earlier, on New Year's Eve 1793, going home to Monticello and avoiding having to deal with Alexander Hamilton any longer. Jefferson was replaced by Edmund Randolph and then Timothy Pickering. But we pretty much have picked up on the fact that while Washington was president, he served as his own Secretary of State. As Washington continued to deal with the political blowback of his neutrality, a much more tangible threat revealed itself in western Pennsylvania. Back in 1791, a couple years before the whole Genet affair, when Congress was trying to pay off the debt incurred by Hamilton's assumption bill and bank plan, they needed to raise funds to pay it. And they did this through an excise tax. In Hamilton's view, the import duties that the Americans had on foreign goods were high enough, so they had to turn to the American people to fund the debt. But here's the rub. The United States owed both foreign nations and private citizens. But the debt to foreign nations, well, it wasn't all that bad, because as long as you owed foreign nations money, it wasn't really in their best interest to do anything but support you, right? I mean, who would want to go to war with a country that currently owed them money? Because otherwise, how would they pay off the debt? So much of the debt that the U.S. was looking to pay off with these excise taxes were to private bondholders in the United States, like the insanely wealthy men, you know, Robert Morris being a perfect example. And you'll want to keep this in mind as we discuss the fallout of the tax. These men who were being taxed felt like they were poor, they were being taxed, and their tax dollars were going to guys who were already too rich to even know what to do with all their money. This was the first tax, this excise tax, the first tax ever levied by the national government on a domestic product. It was a tax on distilled spirits, and since whiskey was by far the most popular drink, it became known as the, quote, whiskey tax. In March of 1791, this was passed into law, and Hamilton felt okay about it. He knew it would be unpopular in general because taxes always were and, as we know, still are. But whiskey was a luxury, and on top of that, there was a small contingent of Americans who viewed drinking alcohol as immoral, so it seemed like the perfect product to tax, unless you were a Western farmer who sold whiskey, of course. So, about these farmers. These guys lived and worked in Western Pennsylvania, near present-day Pittsburgh, and they had a lot of problems with this tax. So let's list them for you real quick. Number one. They believed that the tax was unfairly targeting them. They sold whiskey to make extra money both in their local region and further east. And this clearly was a tax that would place a burden on them. Number two, the reason why it was such a burden was because many of these farmers in the western part of the state were too far away from the markets to take all their extra grain east to be sold. It would be too expensive and too difficult, so instead they would distill it into whiskey which made it possible for them to transport it east to the markets so that they could sell it. Placing a tax on it would cut into the already thin profit margin. Number three, farmers in the West rarely carried cash and at times used whiskey as their currency of choice. This was not the case in the East. Number four, the tax gave two payment options. One of the options was to pay by gallon which is what the Western farmers had to do because they didn't have really cash on hand. They didn't have a choice. The other was to pay a flat fee up front. The larger, more profitable distilleries in the East could mostly afford this upfront fee. This meant that the more they distilled and the more efficient they became, the less they paid in taxes per gallon, making the Western farmers even less competitive. Number five, 
right? I mean, there are a lot of good reasons here. Number five, making matters even worse, Western farmers, since most of their customers in the West had less money, had to sell their whiskey for less. Therefore, the tax, even if it was the same nationwide, was more of a comparable burden on them than it was to their Eastern competition. And lastly, number six, all whiskey stills, even those in the West, had to be registered, and those who didn't pay the tax had to go to federal court. Where was the closest federal court? 300 miles away in Philadelphia. As you can probably see, it was easy for a lot of these Western farmers to convince themselves, pretty absolutely, that this tax devised by city-loving, money-hungry Alexander Hamilton was implemented just to screw them over. And the Eastern whiskey distillers at the same time were all for it. All the same reasons. Combining this tax along with the fact that Western farmers didn't believe the federal government was properly protecting them from natives and they still didn't have navigation rights on the Mississippi because technically that was controlled by the Spanish and the federal government hadn't negotiated otherwise, we can begin to see why these Western farmers had had enough or had it up to here, as my parents would say when I was young. Predictably, the tax was passed, and things did not go so smoothly out west. Tax collectors were scared for their lives, and the money was not being collected. The farmers gathered, formed a convention in Pittsburgh in 1791, and sent grievances to Congress. The tax was reduced slightly, but that wasn't good enough for them. While attempts at nonviolence were proposed, throughout 1791-1792, taxes weren't collected, and the men acted in ways similar to the Sons of Liberty in Boston, beating, intimidating, and tarring and feathering those that stood in their way. Opposition to the tax spread to the western regions of the state, such as Carolinas, Maryland, Virginia, and even Georgia. When the men met in Pittsburgh again in 1792, things were more violent, more radical, and starting to get out of hand. Alexander Hamilton was pissed and had George Washington sign a formal declaration stating that it was illegal to protest a federal excise tax like this. Things continued to heat up in Appalachia throughout 1793 and into 1794, and by May of 1794, over 60 distillers were hit with subpoenas to appear in federal court for not paying the tax. Yep, federal court all the way in Philadelphia. While the government really just wanted to strong-arm the men to comply and not actually have to make them travel all the way to Philly, you can see why this truly was the tipping point for many of these Western farmers. Historians go back and forth on how much influence Hamilton had over these events, whether he actually just sort of like secretly wanted the men to rebel so he could crush said insurrection, and if he manipulated the process to time things in a way to further enrage them. We'll never know the validity of these claims or suppositions or the truth or answers to the questions surrounding his intention. But it is not outrageous to assume that Hamilton had been chomping at the bit for the federal government to make an example of someone, maybe even dating all the way back to 10 years earlier, since the Newburgh Conspiracy of 1783, which more or less disgusted Alexander Hamilton. In the minds of many, Hamilton may have viewed these Western farmers who were brazenly and boldly breaking the law as the perfect opportunity. Once again, as a caveat, I don't read minds. I can't tell you for sure. But, potentially, the federal government would be able to put these men in their place, enforce a type of social discipline amongst them, and hopefully create further American unity. In the summer of 1794, the gangs of militiamen battled the tax collector, General John Neville. In what became known as the Battle of Bower Hill, a few men likely were killed, including rebel leader James McFarlane, a Revolutionary War veteran. With McFarlane's death being portrayed as a murder, the countryside became even more radicalized and this powder keg was exploding. On August First, 1794, about 7,000 men gathered east of Pittsburgh to protest not just the whiskey tax, but also their economic circumstances in general. 
The initial furor over the tax from three years earlier had now built up into a general insurrection against the federal government and all the different ways they were screwing these people over, at least in their minds. At this gathering, men threw around ideas such as breaking away from the United States, joining Great Britain, or even joining Spain. They created their own flag and everything. I mean, these guys were serious. Or at least their camaraderie combined with the whiskey they were probably drinking made them think that they were serious. From the outside looking in, and maybe to loyal listeners of this podcast, this may seem pretty similar to Shays' Rebellion from eight years earlier, which we discussed in episode 74. But unlike Shays' Rebellion, there is a federal government now with an executive in place to handle such challenges. After asking each member of his cabinet, and remember this is a cabinet that no longer included Thomas Jefferson because he peaced out in 1793, for the most part, they recommended to Washington to respond with physical force. Washington sent out men to attempt to negotiate peace, and historians debate whether this was genuine negotiation or just for public relations purposes. Like, uh, before I go out and crush the rebellion, I should at least pretend like I want peace, right? Most believed that physical force was technically the fallback option, but really it was the expected course of action. The commissioners met with the rebels and received mixed results from them, reporting back to Washington that while some agreed to submit to federal authority, they believed force was going to be necessary for full submission. Washington believed that this was likely a result of more Republican pot stirring observing that, quote, I consider this insurrection as the first formidable fruit of democratic societies. While physical force was initially a last resort, Washington eventually saw no other choice. The following month, Washington had had enough. He believed that this was a perfect example of the minority tyrannizing the majority, and he was having none of it. He raised 13,000 soldiers from militias of surrounding states, got on his horse, and led the men out to meet the rebels. Washington chose General Light Horse Harry Lee and none other than Daniel Morgan. Yes, that Daniel Morgan, the old Wagoner, a man that I kept referencing over and over again throughout the episodes on the revolution. He selected Lee and Morgan to lead the militia forces. And this is sort of important, because while it is sometimes portrayed as Washington and Hamilton leading the men into battle, similar to those we have discussed in previous episodes, he more or less just organized the forces, and his presence was logistical and also symbolic. Either way, though, with Hamilton by his side, Washington did ride out of Philadelphia west to command its army, becoming the first and only sitting president ever to do this. Unless, of course, you count President Whitmore from the film Independence Day. But he fought aliens, not drunk farmers. So he should be in like a whole different category of awesome. Nonetheless, in an incredible and dramatic scene that paid the two perspectives of this young nation, you saw those who spoke similar rhetoric of the ancestors of 1776 and the farmers, and those who represented the democratically elected federal government and the militias. As Lee, Morgan, Washington, and Hamilton and the rest of the militia continued west and closed in on the rebels, this, quote, rebellion proved to be a bunch of men who really had no interest in fighting, especially when they saw the army outnumbered them two to one. In the end, almost all of the men were able to escape west into the mountains, with Hamilton brooding that he was not able to make an example out of them. When Washington returned to Philadelphia to address Congress and the nation, He was clear that he supported the idea of dissent, but you could not dissent directly in the face of federal authority, especially threatening violence. Today, we would call those threats, along with action, treason. Pretty much everyone agreed with this assessment, but a bit surprisingly, Madison openly challenged Washington, warning that he was setting a scary precedent. Not surprisingly, the newly retired Jefferson also did not like this outcome, lamenting that the Republican cause was definitely weakened through this action, but there really wasn't much they would be able to do about it. Opponents of internal taxes like the whiskey tax rallied around Jefferson, and the Republican cause actually 
continue to grow in strength, even after this setback. But for the most part, this move by Washington was met with broad popular approval, and is usually viewed as a success by contemporaries and historians, even though it is often conveniently not mentioned that, after all this, the tax was still usually not able to be collected. When Jefferson became president in 1801, this whiskey tax was unsurprisingly repealed. Whether or not this event prompted people to fall in line with federal authority or actively seek out membership in the emerging Democratic-Republican Party is up for debate. But either way, it's an event that will go down in history for all the important reasons we have covered. As you pack up your things, I would like you to consider the very serious issues Washington was dealing with again in his second term. Choosing to stay neutral, dealing with Genet professionally and empathetically at the end of their professional relationship, and squashing the Whiskey Rebellion were not easy decisions to make. In the end, though, they were handled with a plum. Well, for the most part. But Washington's job was not done yet. Next week, we wrap up the rest of his second term, turning our focus to his foreign policy issues and a treaty with Britain. Yes, you heard me. A treaty with Britain. And this treaty will send the Republicans into a furor and make Thomas Jefferson choose to get up off his rocking chair and leave his house at Monticello to make a run at the presidential mansion in Philadelphia. Thanks for listening, and hopefully now you can take pride in knowing just a little bit more about the history of the United States. Class dismissed. Class dismissed.